going to start the recording now. All right, so everyone should see my screen and everyone we're getting started. So again, I want to welcome you to the fair. I, I have been so excited this whole week. I have attended, well, we, had tw we have 20 of them planned and I've attended about 13 of them so far. So tomorrow's our big roundup day and we have two, what do we have, two, four, four of them tomorrow. We left Friday for last, uh, we try not to schedule too many because everybody, you know, people may head out for the weekend, but we have four more scheduled tomorrow. And if you didn't sign up for any of the ones that you want to tomorrow, we have another one about developing your resume and cover letter. We had that just about, what was that, maybe three hours ago we did that, four to five. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have yeah. another one, but it's a totally different presenter and a totally different slant on it. So it'll be kind of interesting to see the difference. I'm actually going to be hosting that one too. Uh, we also have just top skills of a valued employee. Do you have them? And putting your best foot self forward when interviewing, which is a great thing to need. And soft skills, the skills you need to succeed. Kind of another way of doing this body language and your signals that you give off that you may not even be aware of. Hello, Sarah. How are you? Uh, my name is Dr. Sherry. I am been employed at Penn Foster since 2004. I originally started off as an adjunct part-time English instructor, uh, and then I went back to school and got my doctorate in counseling psychology, and in 2010, moved over to the social science area. I always had a love for psychology. I've always had a love for education. I don't want to be a counselor. I want to be a teacher of helping people understand <coughs> psychology and counseling. So that's me, and I am going to now give over the presentation to our wonderful presenter, Kelly, who will give you a little bit about herself. Okay, Kelly, there you go. Thank you, Dr. Sherry, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about body language and the communication of the vocal element. Because so much of our business is done remotely as far as um, customer service, troubleshooting, uh, sales, uh, there is 45% of messaging that can be missed. So tonight, we're going to discuss how to plant, grow, and weed a good communication connection. In the beginning, there's about 20 seconds of music as an intro, just so everyone can gather a, a pen or um, a paper, and then we'll begin. Now, I can't see your screen. Is everybody seeing what needs to be seen? Uh, just give us a little feedback here. Nope, nobody can see Ariel. No, unable to see the screen. We've lost your screen. Hold on for me for just a second. Okay, okay. All right, let me go back to show my screen. Give keyboard and mouse to Kelly. And Whoops. we're going to try that again. Now, do you have, Kelly, do you have up your presentation? I do. Should I close it and open it oh, again? Wait. I, I, I don't know. Can people, can we all see it now? No, they still can't see it. You know what? This may not work for us. Jeez, because we practiced before and it worked. Now it's not going to work. Um, I don't know. What's the difference? Uh, let's see. What's going on? Oh, there it goes. We've got it. We're getting there. Yeah, right here? yeah. well, I've got your screen. You're back on the can when you hear me now. So you, what you might want to do, Kelly, is uh, mm -hmm. change the screen to, um, it says, like, show full screen or something like that without uh, out any icons and whatever. There you go. We're back on there now. So I'm going to let you get started because we're ready. Yes, it has started. Good evening and welcome to Can You Hear Me Now? 
Communication of the Vocal Element. I'm your training specialist, Kelly Rippon, and tonight we're going to discuss what is body language? Is it a replacement for speech, or does it enhance our speech? Body language is authentic messaging. Authentic messaging is unintentional, it's truthful, and sometimes even subconscious. We give off attitudes and feelings with the way that we stand, with the tone of our voice, and with the space at which we put between us and the person we're messaging. Body language helps us identify the meaning behind the message. It's divided into three folds. First, physical. Second, vocal. And third, in the text or words that we choose. 55% of what we say is our postures, our gestures, our facial expressions, and our eye contact. 38% is our vocal messaging. That includes the inflection, the tone, the volume, and the emphasis of our words. And only 7% is tied to what we're actually saying. It's hard to believe. So when we're messaging, 55% is eye contact, facial expressions, gestures, postures, and spatial orientation, or how far away we are to our subject. Here's a question. Which woman in this picture is more open to communication and why? I've asked this question over a dozen times at various seminars. I would say the majority of people agree that B, because she looks friendlier. But if we were to more closely examine their body language, the answer is A. Why? When we look at someone's folded arms, the woman B, even though she's friendly, or she's smiling, both her hands are hidden, which means that she's not extending a hand to you. She's facing you front on, which means she's more formidable that she's harder to break down. She has a more defensive posture. And A is standing sideways, which means you might be able to wedge your idea toward her. She has a, a sideways or diagonal gl glance at you, and she has one arm open, which means she's open for some suggestion. So if you were to, to choose which woman is more open to communication, the answer is A. You must look for cues, I'm sorry, you must look for clues, messaging channel, volume, and pause. Try and make the picture match the sound. In the vocal mechanisms, emphasis, tone, volume, and cadence are important to understand the meaning behind the message. For instance, I'll show you a, a picture of three different women, and each woman are saying, you want me to move my car. The first woman seems to be very compliant. You want me to move my car. The second woman, she looks a little bit more frazzled about moving her car. And the third woman looks a bit angry about it. So it's not the 7% of what the text is, it's the 55% of their body language. And we can only imagine the 38% messaging of the tone The words, or 7%, would include sentences, phrases, commentary, contextual matter, and facts. So here's the breakdown. Looking at our pie chart, 55% is physical, 38% vocal, and 7% words. So 45%, nearly half, of all communication is how it is said. 
that's very telling, especially for remote educators, remote workers. For remote auditory communication partnerships, there's 45% of body language available to message. That's 45% to explain, um, connect, and grow a communication partnership. Improving communication elevates empathy, it elevates acceptance, it elevates confidence, resourcefulness, and improves performance. When seeding a communication connection, think of it like growing something in your garden. First, it must take roots. In order to do that, you have to align or understand where your communication partner is coming from and clarify your intention. Next, after planting the seeds, you want the seeds to grow and break ground. During this phase of you want to maintain command of a calm environment and instill energy at an, in a balanced way. Third, you want to ignite those ideas and, and grow, cross-populate and, and uh, grow ideas. This is solution-focused and performance-oriented. Growing a communication connection with the voice element. Remember those three levels. The first level is to seed. The second level is to engage. And the third level is to ignite. To access a register, think about Weed, need, and seed. The voice register is where we make the connection. It's the tone, the emphasis, and the pitch at which we speak to each other. In the seeding level, that first beginning, you want to make sure that you have a balanced, a calm, and a steadiness. Someone speaking in a lower register, a warmer register like this, would be someone that was giving directions. Um, or perhaps, perhaps uh, a factual lecture. Next would be the need level or that green level. That's an engaging where there would be more voice inflection, there would be rise and fall, and there would be a resolution. Um, this warm register is where something is grown, where there is um, the, the conversation becomes alive. And in the weeding, that it, it, where the conversation is ignited, that's where perhaps some drama, some pause uh, for effort, that's where perhaps there would be a rise, where they'd be expected to have a question answered. Um, that would be the very highs and the very lows. In the, in the weeding level of the conversation growth pattern, that would be where um, change and uh, effort is emphasized. So in the, when we're rooting a conversation, we want to keep it steady. The voice is steady and deeper. It's warm and inviting, stable and secure. Storytelling or that groundbreaking, there's some variation in volume. It's inviting, there's some deviation, and it's at an engaging pace. There's more inflection in tone when we're igniting ideas. Much more variety, perhaps even sound effects or some focus with pauses. Assessing communication. Communication is more than a skill, it's an attitude. An attitude is a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, typically reflected in a person's behavior. When we communicate, we're exchanging feelings. Our ideas are attached to an attitude. Once we understand that attitude, we can build 
a rapport with our communication partner. These are some various feelings that can be translated into body language. We connect with feelings. What is the combination for accessing that right attitude? Depends on your messaging style. Here we have a picture of a rock, paper, and scissors. This is a childhood game that I think we're all familiar with. A rock is kinesthetic. When people speak as kinesthetic messengers, they might say things like, you broke my heart, you twisting my arm, you knocked me out, I come with a heavy heart. Kinesthetic or rock messengers message in feelings. No. What happened? I don't know. Everything is gone. <laughs> oh no. Oh, no. here we are. We're back. We're, We're back. back. Okay. Oh. Oh, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> paper or visual messengers might say things like rat race, um, running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Um, I can never get ahead. This is a tangled web. They're all visual pictures. So when you're listening to someone communicate with you and they're saying words like this, they're giving you clues that they're a visual learner or a visual communicator. Next are our auditory or our scissors. People who are auditory communicators will say things that make sounds. It clicked. It popped into my head. I can do that in a snap. This, you know, my idea is about to blow up. So these are all sound-oriented uh, describing words. So, uh, or action words. So that when people are speaking in sounds, they're giving you clues that they're auditory. How can we use listening skills to unlock this accessibility? When we, when, this is an acronym, ACCESS. It's easy to remember. We align and we connect. Aligning and connection is that first, or that, that brown level, that seeding level. Next is clarity and energy. That's where our conversation or our communication begins to connect and grow. Solution. and service. That's where our ideas are ignited. Did we lose it again? Oh, there it is. No, we're back. We're back. I don't, I don't know why the, there's like a delay sometimes. I don't know if it's my internet or... Um, brainstorming. When you're brainstorming, you want to listen for clues. You want to listen for the tone so that you can align a connection. You want to listen for the energy or the intensity, the attitude of the person. So again, you can command the situation and you can align them in a balanced way so that you can ignite some ideas. Remember those three layers. When we're seeding, we're aligning. And when we align, we need to listen to build a rapport, carefully measure what's being said, and constantly adjust to a balanced alignment. Align with clarity. When we align, we establish order. We make a parallel 
exchange of ideas, and we can integrate nonverbal language. We instill an attitude of empathy. Clarity builds authentic communication. Understand whether it is a rock, a paper, a scissors, a kinesthetic, a visual, or an auditory messenger. This will increase the attitude of acceptance. If someone under, thinks that you understand them, they'll accept what you are saying to them. Energize. When we energize, we offer clarity, we keep a balanced calm, and when things are calm, we, we assert command over the conversation. When you have command over the conversation, people trust you and they have confidence in you. It's important to affirm as you continue the conversation so that it grows and that you keep that clarity. Establish growth in the energized phase. When things are calm, they're quiet, they're cool, and they're soothing. It adds an attitude of composure. Energy is mandatory to instill a positive space, to secure momentum and force to drive the conversation forward. Energy instills an attitude of confidence. Solution. This is where our, our ideas are ignited. This is where growth happens. This is where ideas are formed. This is where people become independent and services inspired. This is solution phase is the shift phase where action takes place. It instills a positive performance. When there's clarity, sensitivity or empathy to others and we have re resolution um, in mind for possible, you know, breakdowns in communication. Solution is at the end. Resourcefulness. When we service something, we're assisting, we're providing maintenance or tune-up. Service gives us the attitude of performance. It makes us doers. To make an access plan, we need to have empathy. These are our emotions. Empathy, acceptance, composure, confidence, resourcefulness, and persuasiveness. Empathy helps us align with others. Acceptance offers clarity for understanding. Composure calmly asserts command. Confidence energizes trust. Resourcefulness is solution-focused strategies. Persuasiveness is service that invites allegiance. Align, connect, clarify, energize, solution, and service. This is a, a, another visual to kind of help remind you the layers of growing a, con a communication connection. So first, we're going to start with that seating level. This is that level in the voice register where there's a balanced, calm, and steadiness. You want to align with clarity and plant seeds that establish roots to make that connection. Once the connection is made, we want to grow that connection. When we grow a connection, we want to make a calm and stable environment. We want to listen focused environment to energize and to grow that connection. We've seeded the connection. We've grown the connection. 
And now we're in the to ignite that connection. This is a solution targeted service and performance. This is connecting with goals. Empathy aligns with others on the right channel. And acceptance cues the clarity of understanding. These are our two seeding emotions. Composure asserts command and direction. And confidence grows trust to continue. These are our two growth emotions. Resourcefulness leads to solution strategy. And performance invites accomplishment and service. These are our solution or performance driven emotions. Growing your access and communication. Thoughtful communication is the attitude of excess or success. Thank you for your attention. I'm open to any questions. Dr. Sherry? Sorry, pushed the wrong button. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're all having technical difficulties tonight. Uh, one of the students asked, or one of the, the people here asked, if we would have this presentation put in the handout. Uh, it's actually not going to go in the handout section. The handout we have now uh, is your certificate of completion. We will have a copy of this when you get in about an hour, uh, you will get an email from us. And in that email, you will get a link to the presentation, which we'll have up on YouTube. And you'll also get another link to, you'll actually have three links, a link to the presentation, a link to your certificate of, of completion, and a link to a short survey, which we're going to ask you to fill out uh, to give us some feedback. Does anyone have any questions right now for Kelly, though, before we, we have some time? Oh, Kaylee wants to know, what was the third C in access called? The, the um, what, you mean in the acronym? The acronym, right. What was the, the third, or the, the, oh, I'm sorry, maybe it wasn't the third C. Yeah, it should be the third C. There's only two C's in action. Yeah, there's only two C's, yes. I mean, maybe she means the second C. It's maybe. a line. It's a line. Connect. Clarity. Energize. Solution and service. Okay, so there you've got them all, Kaylee. Uh, Daisha wants to know, how do you communicate with the person who has a bad attitude? Um, you know, that we're going to have to start in that brown area, you know, where you're seeding communication, and part of that is that alignment or um, uh, the alignment or um, you're assessing the situation. Uh, you want to establish calm. So the first thing is that, you, ne you know, when somebody's speaking, you know, up here and they're yelling, you never want to come up to meet them. You always want to stay in that deeper register. You want to you know, empower them by listening and try and invite them down into that lower register where calm, organized, balanced communication happens. Um, you, one, of the, one of the biggest failures is that when someone comes in that's full of energy, full of anxiety, frustration, anger, sadness, a lot of times when people are communicating with them, they immediately jump to that, that energy and they start speaking loudly or they match the volume. The, the way to um, try and communicate with someone that you know, has a bad attitude is to not mirror that attitude, to offer them you know, an alternative attitude. We Does that help? Uh, they haven't put that comment back. We have, um, Mariel would like to know, what do you think about the Myers-Briggs test? About the personality? Um, uh, Inventory, I, I find them to be very useful. I don't think that you should ever marry yourself to them. Um, I have had 
clients that have had Myers-Briggs and then 10 years later had Myers-Briggs and were not the same person. I do think that there is, you know, uh, we all evolve at some point. I do think we have some core, um, you know, core be beliefs um, that act as a filter. But I do think that through experience and age um, that uh, some of those filters are lifted or, or um, heightened. But um, I do find all of those, because if you're using them for today, Myers-Briggs, 360, um, Highlands, there's so many different um, strongs, there's so many different personality um, evaluatory or assessment that um, everything I think is helpful. The more information, the better. Thank you for that. Well, that uh, I assume maybe that Mary will attend to Dr. Jim's uh, presentation yesterday afternoon, and he did use uh, a form of, I believe it was the Myers-Briggs test, mm -hmm. and then he went through his personnel and how it's proven to work for him. Marce uh, Marceline has a question. How would you put the dress, attire, and look, hair, dress up, makeup? I'm sorry, how would I dress? I'm going to read this exactly as it's written. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. How, how would you put the dress, dressing slash attire and look, and in parentheses, hair, dressing, makeup, etc.? I think what... Well, I think, I, I, well, I think that part of the appearance um, is also telling of your body language because it is an, a self-expressing tool, um, what you're wearing and... and um, you know, how you decorate yourself, whether it's with piercings, tattoos, hair color, eye makeup, lip, lipstick, um, you know, what, what style of dress that you present yourself in. And I will say um, that the, the presenter that was on earlier, m m most of the, in the interview phase, once you get, you're lucky enough to get that interview, you know, when the, when the um, cover letter is accepted, the resume um, meets the mark, uh, most jobs are lost because of the way someone is presenting themselves, whether it be in a physical appearance or whether it's um, in the way that they present themselves with body language. Because m before the person comes to the interview, they have met the mark or they've met the requirements for that job. And generally it's something else, you know, that interrupts the continuation of progress with that. Yeah, one of the things I found very interesting in that last one was, you know, the idea that tattoos, piercings and all of that are becoming acceptable. It, mm -hmm. it depends a lot on, well, because of the laws, they, we, there's really a lot of it, but it is kind of some of those things are still off-putting to a lot of people. So I found that interesting how the, the, you know, and I found that it can make a difference in an interview and, and you're perfectly right. If you're sitting in an interview uh, and actually yeah. here's a comment, if you are a confident and well-spoken person mm -hmm. who sometimes gets nervous and stumbles over your words in a meeting or when giving a presentation, how do you overcome that nervousness? That's a great question. Um, that, that is a very good question. And one of the things we learned tonight about, you know, that green level, or that the brown level, the green level, the blue level, try and force your voice into that brown lower register. Because it's very hard when you're speaking lowly in the, in the lower warm register, it's very hard to convince yourself that you're nervous. You know, if you're calm and you're speaking in a very calm, balanced, steady way versus, I don't know what to do. I don't know, you know, when you go up here, that, that's where all the nervous and anxiety happens. But when you stay low, when you stay steady, it calms the body down from the outside in. Uh, one of the, uh, it's hard not to be nervous. They're saying it takes some composure, but it is hard not to be nervous, especially when so much is at stake when you're going in for, um, uh, a job interview. Here's an interesting, here's another interesting, is it fair to interview on the phone? I love phone interviews. <laughs> um, I, I love phone interviews because uh, there, no one can see the micro expressions and as a body language analyst, 
micro expressions are very telling because even someone skilled like myself cannot hide a micro expression. If someone asks me a question that I'm uncomfortable with or someone asks me a question that I'm unfamiliar with, they're going to see my initial reaction. So no matter what your expertise is, body language is very telling. So I, it's easier to disguise something via the voice than micro expressions, which is nearly impossible to just to. Uh, but I, I think that practicing on the phone is uh, is a very doable exercise. Um, I think probably from uh, a cur the current generation of millennials, they're not on the phone a lot because they are more of a texting generation versus a phone call generation. So I do think we are we possibly are creating um, or or a generation is being created that is a less verbally comfortable generation. All right, Michelle, uh, they're saying thank you. That was helpful. Um, Michelle said she was has been in the business world for eighteen years and just has learned. To try to learn just to be yourself. Try not to mm -hmm. be what you think the interviewer viewer is wanting to see. That is interesting. And how does one that, you do know that? that's, that's that's very good. You know, well, knowing who you are and being okay that maybe you were a 3.0 student instead of having that anxiety of pretending that you were something that you aren't. Um, or that you have two years experience but you're incredibly passionate and you know that you bring this passion that might excuse 10 years experience or might equal that of someone with 10 years experience. I agree with that. I do think that um, you know, uh, if you believe in yourself, it's very attractive and uh, it's very noticeable and I think that when you believe in yourself and you're comfortable with yourself, it's hard to resist. Now, I actually have a question for you. Um, when I go into a public place, I'm not a person who ever wears makeup, but yet I feel, because mm -hmm. of the age I am, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be mm -hmm. 62 this year, that when I go out, I should have makeup on. How mm – -hmm. it makes me very uncomfortable, though, but yet I don't feel complete without it when I do something like that. How does one – or if you're – a younger person and you're just not used to or maybe you need to learn to tone down your makeup but it's not you anymore how do you overcome that um well i think you know what we're, sometimes we are either too harsh with ourselves or we are not harsh enough um you know sometimes we wear things that we think fit us or that we wear things that um, we want to look a certain way i think it's important before an interview one, that you're true to yourself, that you're not trying to look, you know, um, if you're not comfortable wearing makeup, then I would wear as close to natural looking. And I, I, I'm not an expert, of course, in makeup or anything, but I do know that there are different things that you can look, that have a more natural um, day look to them. And there's, of course, another evening gala look. But I think that that's when you have to reach out. You can't just ask your friend. You know, you reach out to people that do, do this for a living, you know, that um, work on appearance and what, what is the best, you know, style for you or what's the best um, look for you. And um, practice, because I would not only practice with, you know, we would spend weeks drafting and recreating the perfect resume. And we should be doing that as far as our exchange, our interview practice, or our mock interview questions. We should have people ask us those things. Practice on the phone. Practice um, dressing and, and being comfortable. Because a lot of times, people might have a job where they're in scrubs or they're in you know, a very casual you know, uh, uh, sports shoe or tennis shoe. And then all of a sudden they're applying for a job where they're in sales or they have to have a more dressed, uh, dressed up appearance. And that whole outfit might not be a comfortable feel for them. That's something that they might have to get used to. So that is something I would say practice everything. Practice the look. Practice so that you don't have that inhibition and you don't have that, that f feeling that you, you feel or you look awkward. Because if you feel that way, we're reading that. From, from this side. 
Great, great. Mariel uh, is asking, I have heard, here's what she's saying, I have heard that people who are interested in you, whether as a person in general or romantically, Ooh. are unable to not look at you or make micro expressions. Can you share some of those experiences with us? Okay, I think what you're talking about is maybe if someone feels a little bit embarrassed, you know, if 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 there's a if someone has an attraction to you, a lot of times you're processing that. And when people are processing things, they're looking away or they're looking into space. So I think maybe that's what you're thinking of. Um, I am not a, an expert in relationships, so I don't know if that's the tendency. You're the psychologist, Dr. Sherry, so I, <laughs> I, I, I can say that what you're describing and people looking away is there, there are um, six main universal emotions, okay? Anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. Those facial, um, the, the facial connects or the facial um, expressions are universal. So if we went to New Guinea, if we went to, you know, Toronto, if we went to Mexico City, if we went to Sofia, Bulgaria, if we went to St. Petersburg, Russia, Everyone would have the same look on their face if they were angry, if they were disgusted, if they were feared, uh, fearful, if they were happy, sad, or surprised. Now, there's two other emotions that a lot of body language specialists are, are I believe that are part of that universal expression, and that's contempt and embarrassment. And embarrassment is one of its its it's a it, it's kind of on both sides of the if you want to say positive or re, re, resourceful or negative or unresourceful um, emotions and embarrassment is a trigger that you're out of your comfort zone so it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing something wrong it just means that you're doing something you're not comfortable with or that's new so a lot of times when someone realizes that you know, they might have feelings, you know, romantic feelings for someone, and they're, they're thinking, I wonder if these feelings are being returned or reciprocated. They could have that little bit of panic or embarrassment because they're out of that comfort zone. It doesn't mean like they're, they're doing something wrong or that they are um, too embarrassed to get eye contact. They're just processing. So if that helps, I don't know if that explains it, but... Um, I found it very what you were saying very precise. It, we're talking about actually two different situations in this case. I can't imagine going on an interview and having someone suddenly be interested in me romantically. I don't think that way. Uh, that's just not the appropriate place for no, it. No, no, no. I don't. I, I honestly don't think she was thinking of interview. I think she was thinking of perhaps workplace romance or something. Oh, or, see. Or perhaps. Yeah, I did I not work with, it. I, I work with mostly process. women. Mostly women, and <laughs> I've known way too long. Uh, so there you go. Uh, that's interesting, it, it, that it would be an interesting concept. I just find there are some people, though, that are – the eye contact for a lot of people is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that they're disrespecting you, and it doesn't mean that they're embarrassed or anything. It's just their way. It's, so, it's, it's like a cultural of thing course. that many people – or raised. There are certain mm -hmm. things that you do when you when you speak to someone who has a different uh, a different position than you, or you're meeting for the first time. And I, there's all I, of us that have been trained she, that way. I think, Sherry, we all know people who um, are very physical. They're huggers. You know, when they see you, the first thing they do is hug you. And there are some people that are very uncomfortable with that. And the eyes are another. It's a personal invasion. Just like hugging someone, you're getting into somebody's space and you're, you know, making contact with their body. Eyes are the same, especially for, for people who are very visual. That's, you know, by getting eye contact, you're making a connection or hugging with the eyes. And if you're visual, if you're a visual person and you're a very private person, people don't like to make a lot of eye contact because that's a lot of connection. That's intimacy for someone who's visual. People who are auditory, many people don't care about eye contact because it's it's it means it doesn't mean as much. 
Now we have another one from Wendy who says, how would you communicate with someone who is always angry, no matter what is going on, even when you try to maintain your calm and positivity? Well, you know, communication um, is a, uh, or a partnership. It's, um, you, it, it is a cooperative action. So when someone is that angry, that is like trying to drink the milk out of the carton without opening it. There is no connection. And you cannot communicate with something that isn't open, at least a tiny, tiny bit that you could wedge something in. So if someone is that resistant, um, I would say time. Time, um, perhaps you can um, break the ice with exchanging some um, you know, body language, you know, using some motion instead of speech, um, maybe listening to some kind of song together that might m send a message, you know, like invite a third party, like a song or a movie or a TV show or, or a video game or something like that, that might bring a message, m m maybe figuratively, into the conversation. Um, so that it can speak on your behalf, but um, I think you have to remind yourself that if someone is unwilling to at least provide a sliver where you could connect, and they're going to be a, a you know stone wall, communication is um, cooperative, and if the other person is not cooperating, you are not communicating. All right, we have another question here from Kaylee. She asked, what can help if you talk really fast and nervous as a kind of your natural way? So many, I, I see this with so many people that mm -hmm. that's, my daughter's one of them. She's always mm -hmm. fast, 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 fast. What, mm -hmm. uh, she would like to know, what can help to slow it down and make being slow a little mm -hmm. more natural? Lower your register. Because it's very hard to speak fast when you're intentionally lowering your voice. It, when you're way up here and you can talk really fast, I don't know what I'm going, you've got to come with me tomorrow. And about, you, the higher the pitch, the faster the intensity. Deliberately lower your voice. That's a great idea. That's, that's great. Edna wants to know, how can you overcome nervousness during an interview if you're an uncontrollable shake, like if you're trembling and it's just maybe mm -hmm. kind of part of your personality as well. What, what are the tricks? What can, you yeah. have, what can you do besides practice? Right. You know, I think one thing is you have to put everything in perspective. You know, when, when, um, when I, you know, that, that adage about, you know, my, you, 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 I, I complained about not having shoes until I met a man that had no feet. And I think that, that something like that is, can be very helpful in a situation like that. When you realize that the, the job interview isn't punishment, it's opportunity. Take a deep breath and breathe out. Okay? And then you realize that this is um, not life or death. Again, it's a happy opportunity. And any kind of, um, just because you're nervous, you know, when you think of other times that you're, think of like times that you overcame that nervousness and it was in a positive way. Like, I always remember like getting on a roller coaster and thinking, oh my God, I can't believe I'm getting on this roller coaster. I can't, and then getting on the roller coaster and getting off and wanting to get on it again. But when I was down on the ground looking up at that thing going up and down and around and around, I thought, no way am I ever getting on that. And then somehow my kids talked me into getting on it. I'm strapped in and all I kept thinking about was, is this seatbelt tight enough? Is this worrying about, oh, the, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to fall out. I kept thinking I was going to fall out. And I would be that one person that fell out of the safety seat. And um, then just kind of relaxed and realized other people, one, other people have done this before and survived, right? It's just your turn to get on the roller coaster and enjoy the ride because whether or not you get that job, you are, you might, this might be the place where you learn that interview skill that gets you the best job. And that one might be coming after this. Sabrina wants to know, uh, is it true that an interviewer seat should be higher than the interview so they feel dominant? They actually do do that. It's not, it's not false. Um, there is a great um, TED Talk by um, uh, 
Amy Cuddy. Uh, she is a neuroscientist from Harvard University, and she talks about, she did papers on becoming big, and she talks about, um, when, you know, when you think it, you become it, well, she thinks that you should become it, and then your brain will be convinced that it should start thinking it. So she says that when you are um, nervous, stretch yourself out and be bigger. Don't kind of hunch together and crouch over a small area. Stretch yourself out and feel big. Um, interviewers do this because many times they will stand and they'll ask you to sit. Um, interviewers will have, they'll lean over their desk so they're looking down on you. It's important that when, um, when someone is interviewing you that you want to narrow them. So if they're looking straight on, you should look straight on. Um, and angle your, but angle your body in a way so that you're open, just like we had that, that, um, the pictures of the two women. The smiling woman and the more natural looking woman, she, the one that was angled, was, it's easier to talk to her because she doesn't look like she's flat, you know, resisting you, like pushing you back. But yes, it is true that, that people, um, when they're interviewing you, they will take a dominant role and they will stand or their desk is a little bit higher than when you're sitting um, or they'll command and they'll have both arms open across their desk so they appear bigger than you. But you want to try and mirror what they're doing. Does that help? That's great advice. Um, Nicole would like to know, we've dealt with people who are angry. How do you deal with naggers, people who nag? The all, remember now, we have that brown level, we have the green level, and then we have that blue level. Keep, pull it back, read, check your seeds, <laughs> and, and uh, reseed. Don't empower a nagger. You know, don't try and change them because the, they're hearing, you know, if someone says, this is never going to go right, and then if you say, oh, but why do you say that? It's going to happen. It's going to... Ignore. Ignore. Change subject, reroute. You know, when you are traveling in this um, road to communication, and just like your GPS, when you, when you get somewhere and it, you end up like there's a detour or something like that, the lady or the man comes on the GPS and says, recalculating route. That's exactly what you have to do when someone throws you, you know, a, a big pothole like that in your communication track. Do not take the invitation to go into the, the nagging or empower me because I, I'm the Debbie Downer in the conversation reboot and um, ask a different question or change the subject. But don't, don't um, acknowledge and don't empower. That is great advice. I, I don't see any more questions. So we are coming, we're, we're still, at, oh, wait, wait, nope, I do see more questions. I lied. <laughs> they just <laughs> stuck the them. They so them in at the last second. Let's see. Um, the last communication class I had at work informed us that when you are listening to someone talk, you are supposed to have an open stance and not your arm, not have your arms crossed, and you are supposed to ask questions to give the impression that you're interested. They called it active listening. What are Correct. your all you all thoughts on this? Because the slide with the two women kind of contradicted that. And actually, everybody that was writing their responses was putting B, that that B looked more friendly. Yes, yes. Um, okay, great, 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 very, very great question. Um, active listening is true. And yes, as a courtesy, we're talking about the optimal active listener would have an open stance, optimally, have an open stance, um, targeted eye contact, and even tilting their head sometimes, if, if, you can still con if you can still communicate with the person that asked that question, many times they'll tilt their head in the direction of the person speaking to imply um, that, you know, they're interested. What I was showing you were two people. We're not talking about active listeners. We're talking about two people in general. Which one of the two would be most likely to listen? So we weren't saying that either of those two people were optimal. We were just saying they were two people that you might just come across. And which one, was, which one did you have a better chance of conveying your message to? And the reason why the person who was flat on 
with folded arms and no hands peeking out was that her position was already decided. She was showing an inflexibility about her attitude. The other person, um, even though she, she wasn't as smi smiling as much, she still had an angular position, which meant that she was tilted toward what you were saying, and she had one hand free. Many times when you're speaking to somebody, sometimes you can't control the temperature in an office, and people do fold their arms. Um, sometimes it's a nervous habit with people. But you will find that an active listener will have one hand peeking out. If people don't have any hands peeking out, they're not listening and they're not interested. But what seminar, whatever you're talking about, an active listener optimally will have an open stance, will have eye contact, and will somehow turn their body or lean into the listener. So all of the information that you learned in that seminar regarding an active listener is true. But they are talking about how you can become the best active listener. The two examples that I showed you were two average people really not trying that hard to be good active listeners. Jason said that makes sense. All right. Well, we are coming closer to – oh, we're getting more. Uh, okay. I'm oh, good. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, how do you walk away from, say, a client that wants to talk and talk and talk, and you need to move on either to get to the next client or do whatever needs to be done? Um, well, you know what, you can, there are ways of ending things. You know, when someone keeps talking, you can say something that's, when they're, because usually when people are talking, 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 it's about detail. So how you can do that is present the opposite. So when somebody's saying about, and then this person said this, and then this person said that, and then, and you can say something to wrap it up with, you know, I love listening to your stories, and it is always a pleasure when I visit you. I'll be here again next Monday. Let's take this up then. You have an awesome weekend. Or I always love, instead of, in, instead of um, returning a response to what they're talking about, you're going to answer them in a general way. Like, I, it's something empowering. I always love coming and visiting and listening to your stories. Or it's always a pleasure for me to see you. You're generally so upbeat, something positive and then exit. That's great advice. And we do that on the phone. Unfortunately, we have to sometimes uh, because mm -hmm. the student is off track or whatever. And that's what we kind of do. We said we really, really loved listening, uh, but we need to. And it, it's really great that you have these and feelings. That is one thing. If um, you could avoid the word but, because yeah. but is a however with a dinner jacket. It is. Um, uh, it it, it 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 sometimes people you know I want to hire you but yeah, you know the other shoes gonna drop like it's a rejection <laughs> exactly a rejection but if you keep it all in one thought I love coming here and I I'm gonna be here next week okay. that implies that you're leaving okay I think we have time for one more because we are coming close to the top of the hour and we have some other things we need to do before we actually close sometimes there are coworkers or people in the workplace that aren't the most appropriate. And it makes us mm -hmm. feel uncomfortable. I am very expressive in my face, and I try to be conscious and keep it as professional as possible. How, what are some tips for working on facial expressions? Tips for working on facial expressions right. that are inappropriate? If, if, well, no. If you know that you're a very emotional person, if, if you're a very expressive person, and you <coughs> see someone doing what you believe is unprofessional or inappropriate for in the oh. office. How do you not give it away and be politically correct? I think correct? That's, that requires practice. And, and then you have to, re, you know, you reintroduce, you know how they say, um, you know, like orange is the new black or something is the new, you're going to have to have a new facial look that is the new surprised or the new repulsive. <laughs> so you're going to have to practice in the mirror and it's going to be a dead stare. And that is good. You're going to have to retune your brain to say this is this is what where I'm going when I'm surprised, or this is where I'm going when I'm offended. This is my new offended face. That's great. Uh, we have. I said we were going to do one more, but uh, this was referring back to the TED talk that you mentioned. What was the name, Amy? 
What Cuddy. Was Amy Dr. Cuddy. Amy Cuddy. Cuddy. There you go. Okay, Michaela. Dr. Our, Amy Cuddy. We're getting and a you lot. welcome, Amy Cuddy, for me getting you all the TED Talk <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, getting you all the TED, TED, TED Talks. We are getting a lot of questions now about just uh, the, the thing that I'm going to talk about now. This has been... Um, oh, wait, we have, I want, I, they're coming in again. How would you say no or enough to your boss who is always asking you to do her tasks and you get behind with your own tasks? Um, sometimes people don't realize that they can actually ask. You can say, you know, when somebody says, you, some people feel that they can't say no. And I, it's important that you keep that communication open. Um, you can simply ask in a very polite way. Um, you know, if she says, can you pick up my dry cleaning, you know, um, and you, you can say, you, may I get that later today? I would like to accomplish my you know, my Stein report before 2 o'clock, it is due. Um, you know, or, you know, head her off at the past or him off at the past. Go in in the morning. If it's not in your job description, then I think you're going to have to sit down and have an open conversation about that, whether or not you mind doing these things or whether there's time allotted for these things or readdress what your job description is. But if somebody's asking for favors, most of the time, they're asking because you're, you are giving that vibe that it's okay with you. Most people aren't going to ask you things um, that you're uncomfortable with or that maybe you're such a great employee, you have all this spare time. You know, I, I don't know, but I think keeping it open and asking if there's, you know, if you sh say, I'd like to prioritize, you know, I, um, my goal today is to get this report done by 2 o'clock. Would it be okay with you if... Um, I, I stopped back after the report was done, and if time permits, I would be glad to help you out. That's a great suggestion, and people are starting to thank us, and I am going to have to stop taking questions at this point, and just because some of the questions are about this. Yes, we're going to send out copy, well, links for you to access this talk again. Uh, there was so much great information and so much uh, wonderful graphics in it. So if you want to sit in again and watch it at your own leisure and stop and start, do whatever you want, you can do that. At the end of this session, in about an hour, you are all going to get an email. And that email will give you the information on how to access this recording because we did record it. The other thing is in that email you will have a, a, a link to a short survey to kind of give us feedback on to what you learned, what you thought you needed more of, or if it was enough, or whatever. It gives us information to the committee, and it gives us information for the presenter. The other thing that's in that email will be a certificate of attendance, a link to it. Now, that link is not a live link, and we've had a lot of uh, issues with that this week. You literally, you have to copy and paste the link to go to the, into your browser to get to your certificate of completion. And again, there is actually a certificate of completion right here on your, on your go to webinars thing. Um, and you're welcome to print that out. But we would like for you to take those few minutes and go to that uh, short survey. We do have some other Dr. great- Sherry? Yes, go ahead. Um, if someone wanted to offer feedback or ask additional questions, they can email me at kelly.ripon at gmail.com. I'd be glad to take their questions. That's fabulous. And so all of you heard that. If you have questions that you would like to ask Kelly directly, uh, Kelly's going to get some of the feedback. Well, she's going to get a copy of all the feedback. But um, it's kelly.ripon, and her name is spelled right here, R-I-P-P-O-N, and it was at gmail.com. Yes, yes. For those that had questions that never got to get asked tonight, um, I'd be glad to answer them. Yeah, I think I got to most of them. Most people are now saying amazing presentations and how much they've learned. So again, uh, if you're happy about this and you want to share that, yay, this has been great, hashtag Penn Foster or go on to the community and share your thoughts. Plus, you'll also have that survey. And there are more webinars coming up. This is the last one for today, but tomorrow we have one, two, three, four of them beginning at 10 a.m. Eastern, and it's developing your resume and cover letter, and that is tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, and then we have top skills of a valued employee. Do you have them? 
putting your best self forward when interviewing, which should be fascinating, and soft skills, the skills you need to success. And I, I believe that one's going to be more like this one where we're going to be talking about how to control that emotion that if you're a fairly expressive in per person, uh, maybe some more tricks of the trade for you. So I want to thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening.